in the interest of time, I know people are getting their food. I know we are, we're in between classes, et cetera. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I also want to give permission. We have students that I know they have to get into an HMP class. So, um, you know, please, uh, uh, it won't be rude. We know you might have to exit a little bit sooner. So, but at this point, it, it really gives me amazing pleasure. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Dr. Richard German, the interim dean here at Rowan Virtuous School of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome a special lecturer and update from the first Rowan Virtuous SOM alumnus to become president of the American Osteopathic Association, Dr. Ira Manka. As many as you know, Dr. Mock is one of the most recognized leaders in the osteopathic medicine, uh, both in the state of New Jersey and now nationally. He now brings a reputation and his extraordinary leadership ability to the national level as president of the American Osteopathic Association. And he brings along Ron Virtua SOHM right alongside his journey as he goes across the nation. Or... Dr. Bonka, we're so pleased and grateful for this extraordinary appointment um, and know that we're as a proud alumni to the School of Osteopathic Medicine with an unwavering commitment to advancing the school and supporting our mission. A little bit about Dr. Monka. He's an AOA board certified family medicine physician and graduated in 1984, if they made me say that, uh, from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, now the Rowan Virtuous School of Osteopathic Medicine. He completed family medicine uh, residency at Union Hospital, and Dr. Maka is a past president and member of SOM Alumni Association Board and the past president for New Jersey Osteopathic Association of Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons. At SOM, Ira and his wife, Esty, who's with us today, created an endowment that funds two scholarship awards through the Ramanka um, Lev Levkovitz Family Holocaust Memorial Scholarship. Both families were among survivors of the Holocaust. The scholarships which were awarded annually to SOM students recognize students with financial need who promote tolerance, cultural sensitivity, and diversity to community service. When asked what drives him, Dr. I Ramanka humbly states, Quote, the profession has helped me get to where I am today. Why should I not give back? Certainly a sentiment we should all keep as we move forward in our careers in every aspect of it, whether we're medical students, attendings, and administrators. I will extend our very best wishes to you and look forward to hearing about your journey and goals that you have set forth in our profession during your term as the AOA president. I gave him a few more today, a little bit earlier today, I will say. Please welcome me and welcoming Dr. Ira Manka, our president. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Everybody hears me okay? We're good. This is my mic. The mic is right here. Okay, thank you. So listen, this is a pleasure to be here today, um, especially to be standing in this big auditorium room here because when I was here and finished in 1984, our whole, the whole school was the Kennedy Professional Building next door and that was it. We were 35, 36 students, and um, we spent two years here, and we had a great time, and um, it's so nice to see the expansion and growth of our school, and I'm just amazed where the school has come from and the opportunities, opportunities I have gotten for being a student here, and every one of you have the same opportunities I have. I bring greetings from our a other AOA leaders, our CEO, Kathleen Creason, and President-elect Teresa Hupka, both Wish you guys well, do well in your studies and school and anything the AOA could do to help. Please let us know because we're going to be here for you. Not working. 
There we go. Okay. So as I started my president, actually as president-elect last year, I looked at some of the interests and, and key areas that the AOA is facing in terms of our growth. Our, our profession has grown tremendously over the last 30 years, but some of the lagging behind our membership board certification areas were not keeping up with pace with our growth. So we started a couple work groups this past year, membership work group and board certification work group. And we are at the conclusion of those work groups and the board has approved the funding that it'll take because we want to really push to let our osteopathic physicians and students know, you know, become members. How many in this room are a member of the AOA now? Okay. Now, you know that every student here is a member, whether you signed up or not. I think you're all in. You're all members. And uh, for the four years, there's no cost. We want your membership. We want your involvement. There's committees, councils you can get involved with. We, we have a Bureau of Emerging Leaders. So we want you, your opinions matter to us because the future of our profession is going to be in your hands. You know, my future, I'm at the tail end of my future, but we want to grow the future for you to keep it bright. We want the future of the profession to be wonderful because it is it is the best medical profession in this country by far, and I'll show you why in, in some slides. And the second work group was the board certification work group, which also is an important work group because we want to make sure that students who become residents go on to get certified. And don't forget the AOA certification process. It's a tremendous process. It will give you everything you need in, in, in your careers and support you and be behind you. And we want to make sure that you understand how we promote this distinctiveness of osteopathic medicine through membership and board certification. There we go. We've changed the way we've done our board certification process. We're making it easier. And we have, you don't have to go to centers and take these big, big standardized tests. There's ways of getting around that now and being certified in a much easier way. You don't have to have remote exams. There's OMT designation. If you're a family doc and it's part of your certification process, you have it all at one. But if you want to be certified in OMT also, there's ways you could do that through our profession. We're trying to make sure you understand. OMT is a great tool that every osteopathic physician can use. I use it in my practice. Uh, students who are with me see how I use it. Uh, not only does it, you treat your patients to a better level, but you also find that you don't need as much medications and testing when you use OMT and you're actually doing a better job for your patients. A lot of times patients I'll have C who come in just for OMT. They're not coming in for their blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. You know, my back hurts, my neck's bothering me. Can you help me out, treat me? And it's a great tool and it separates us from our allopathic partners out there. And um, as AI, which I don't really talk much about AI, but AI is becoming prominent, as you all know, um, in, in medical careers, in medical future. AI, AI can replace allopathic physicians at a higher level than can osteopathic physicians because AI cannot do OMT. Third goal was the strategic financial um, task force that we put together because we want to make sure, again, our future is bright with with the finances of the AOA, we have a very strong financial structure. We have a great reserves. We have a building in Chicago. If you ever come to a meeting in Chicago or in Chicago for any reason, stop by the AOA building. It's a beautiful building. We'd love to have you come in and get a tour. Um, we own that outright, so it's a great resource for us. We also have uh, our Washington office for politics in Washington, D.C., and it's a very key point there in terms of trying to work with our legislators to get issues passed, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit. Now we have strong relationships and these are relationships that are very important to you guys, the AACOM, American Association College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is our deans all belong to. You have the NBOME, National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, which is setting up your COMLEX exams. And you got COMLEX one and two, 
You need to pass to graduate. Then you have to pass COMLEX number three um, to get licensed. And then once you have your fourth exam, which is your board certification exam, uh, but NBOME runs that. We also partner with CDC, NIH, and a lot of governmental agencies. We also have relationships with the Department of Health, Human Services, CDC. We work on task force for COVID, influenza, sepsis prevention, public policy and behavioral health issues, which are very, very important these days. We have a lot of co cooperation corporations that we partner with on HPV, pneumonia, COVID, respiratory syncytial virus, health disparities, which is a very common area of, of discussion today. We wanna to make sure that you know, rural America and people who are underserved are well taken care of. And our profession is doing that better than our counterpart again, because if you look at the growth of healthcare in America, most of the schools in the osteopath profession are being started in rural states and in rural areas. And we're expanding that and able to serve the rural America very well, much more than we're seeing from the allopathic side, who are mostly in urban centers. The schools are not going to be in rural America. We also work very closely with our state affiliate. We have our president of our state association, Dr. Scott, which I'm sure you all know. And we also have our executive director, Tyme McCatorick. She, they're gonna come up with me later on. We're gonna talk a little bit together about our state association and how we interact with our students, with our docs in the state, talk about our convention, and we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, relationship between the school and our state association. And we wanna keep building on that. Now, last year, this past year, seven, 850 physicians finished residency and, and joined the workforce, osteopathic physicians. We have a 30% increase in the number of osteopathic physicians in this country in the past five years alone. Tremendous, tremendous growth. We used to be in the single digits, low single digits. We're up to 11%. 25% of all graduating physicians in America today are osteopathic. We anticipate that to hit 30% within a couple of years because of the expansion of all the schools we have, and each school, and, and as you see here, look at the growth you have at, at uh, Rowan Virtual alone. Tremendous number of growth and opportunities. Five to 10 new schools will be opening in the next five years in our profession, and again, most of them will be in rural America. Now, our postdoctoral trainees. So we had a record-breaking match this, pair, this past year, National Registry Match Program, 99.5% of all osteopathic fourth year students were able were matched in the program. They matched in 37 different specialties and we see increased placement in a lot of the subspecialties. This past year was the first year that more osteopathic family medicine resident matched than allopathic uh, family medicine match. So we, this is the first time ever We've exceeded the allopathic match in family med. That number will continue to grow next year and, and years to come. The numbers are just going to get larger and larger um, as our schools increase their size and the new schools open up. Now, what kind of engagement we have with our students? We want to make sure we, we have students on the American Osteopathic Board of Trustee right now. We have students on our bureaus, committees, councils. There's a student on the DO editorial board. You see the DO magazine. We have the SOMA column on a weekly newsletter. We have an AOA Leadership Academy, which I believe there's one student from Rowan that I saw in the Leadership Academy. And that meets actually this Friday, we'll be in Chicago into Saturday for this Leadership Academy. We have young physicians, students who wanna be future leaders and, and they apply for this position and they get into it and we're training with them, working with them to help them get to their goals. At OMED, which is our national meeting every year in the fall, the OMED student track, we make sure we have information and lectures for our students that are, is pertinent to what their careers need. And we have the student parity town hall 
which I will get into more about the parity issue. Um, actually, it's right here. Good. So, as you know, there is issues. Years and years ago, there was a lot of discrimination against osteopathic graduates going into residency programs, getting jobs, getting on uh, executive levels at hospitals and throughout the medical profession. But those days have, are, are hopefully behind, behind us. They're long gone, and it's changing dramatically. Um, we have joint statements from recognized professional organizations saying the MDDO equivalency is at its peak right now. And we're making sure that we're fighting for every student right as a third and fourth year in terms of rotations, number one. If you ever get, call up a facility and they say you're an osteopathic student, don't apply, let us know. That's discriminatory behavior and that cannot happen in, in the present day. If you apply to a ro for a rotation uh, for placement for residency in the future and they say, DO, do not apply, let us know. And the same thing when you go for your match programs, if anyone ever tries to discriminate against you, please let us know. That should not be happening anymore. It still does, unfortunately, in some programs, but it's becoming smaller and smaller. Program directors are the key for acceptance of our students into residency programs. And whenever you're on your rotations, make sure you get to, if you can meet your program directors those who will make decisions on your behalf, get to let them know who you are, shine in those rotations so that they want you when it comes time for selection for residency programs. There's some filters out there that have screened out our, our profession, and we're working on getting these filters removed. And again, working, we're actually working with AMA, believe it or not, on these non-discriminatory policies because they're with us on that. They don't want to see discrimination in our profession and vice versa. This is just a list of some of the uh, associations out there that are partnering with us to stand up and say, we are equal and equity in all rotations, residency programs should occur. And it's very important that we have more and more of these organizations stand with us. This slide is what I use, I, when I give a lecture to uh, oste just osteopathic physicians, I tell them, they always say, you know, why do I pay dues and what's the dues for? This is my slide that I say is really what we do as an AOA profession for everyone and covers your cost of the dues that you pay because you're going to get your money back 10 times over here. We have our state and international government affairs office that works on scope of practice, licensure, liability protection. These were areas that were years ago more of a problem in terms of licensure in some states, but that's gone now. All 50 states give equal licensure to uh, osteopathic physicians, and we continue to monitor for scope of practice issues so we could take care of them. Our regulatory affairs office worked on the Dr. Lorma Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, which is dealing with mental health burnout in our profession, and it's something that the current, um, our current president was supportive of, and we're happy for that. We also work on stopping Medicare cuts, physician payments, and HIT. So every year we face battles in Washington and our Washington office helps us here fighting these decreased salaries for us, decreased cuts. They wanna always lower our salaries and we fight back and you know they start off and we're gonna take 8% away this year. We fight and we get down to 2% and they call it a win. To me, no, no, it's a loss because in the last 10 years, the average cost of a practice to run has increased by over 25%. Average increase Medicare has paid us is 6%. So we, we have to do better and the government has to treat us better. Now, HIT up to prior to COVID was not something you were able to get. Telemedicine was not something you were able to get reimbursed for. The emergency crisis occurred, telehealth came into play. We have it now funded for the last four years. It's extended for another year. We want to see where a health, a telemedicine can be incorporated into, into practices. It's not going to be for every patient you see, but there's going to be a, a listing of what patients will work the best. Telehealth works great, infectious disease, patients with flu, COVID, RSV. It, helps, it works well in mental health areas. And there's other areas where patients are live too far away in rural areas to come in. And if you could help them through telemed, it's important, we stand behind it and we're fighting for a permanent fix for telemedicine in our profession. 
Our Congressional Affairs Office works on prior authorization reforms in Medicare, surprise billing, liability protection, and debt relief. All right, here's another question. How many in this room have debt for medical school? You know, I, I'm sure you all know what the interest rates have changed over the last few years. And if you take an average of $250,000 debt, you go to residency and you get your first paycheck, and then you get a letter from your, your uh, bank saying, uh, time to make your interest payment. 250,000 costs you $20,000 a year, just interest. And if you're making sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 before taxes, that 20,000 a year is probably gonna be half your take-home pay. So we're fighting, and we've gone to Washington on this in, in fighting for uh, holding back interest payments throughout residency. So it's called the Ready Act, and I'll show you more about that in a little bit. And our grassroots office is working on access to care, entitlements, regulatory reform, scope of practice, physician workforce. So we're trying to cover the bases to make sure everybody has equal opportunity for practicing osteopathic medicine. This past year, the House passed a $1.44 billion six-year reauthorization for teaching health center GME, the THC GME program, which is programs that open up offices in rural parts of America. They are staffed by a lot of osteopathic physicians and during their residency programs. So we were very happy to see this happen. It was a double of what we asked for. We asked for three years, they gave us six years. The only thing holding it back right now is, you know, in Washington, you have to remember, the Senate, the, the House can pass something on a 50-50 basis. Now the Senate's working on it and they have to get the funding for it passed. And the Senate works at a 60-40 mark. So you need 60 senators out of 100 to pass things. And that's partly where things get tied up is at the Senate level. So we're hoping that they'll do that. Last year, um, they approved 200 new additional Medicare funded GME slots for five years, which would be 1,000. We had a meeting last Thursday with the chief policy person at the White House, and she was very excited. You know, we got you 200 new slots, and my answer to her was, thank you so much, but you need another zero at the end. Then we'll be talking good numbers, because then we have 2,000 a year. I think that's what we're gonna need. Um, do not be scared off by, you're not gonna get a residency. You're all gonna get residencies here. The numbers are still far apart between the number of graduating students in this country and the number of slots. The toughest slots are the hardest, you know, the toughest residencies are the hardest ones to fill, but there is gonna be slots for everybody. So don't be caught up with any fear that you're gonna finish four years and not be able to do residency. You're, you're gonna, and especially to well, as well as everyone shines here, I think it's a 100% match every year, if I'm not mistaken. We're pretty close to it, better than 99.5%, right? You guys do good. Again, as I mentioned, uh, Medicare telehealth was on the table and we're trying to fix that for a permanent fix. And then here's that 8.5% Medicare pay cuts that they show us and then we end up negotiating and they come down to 2% and they say, oh, wasn't that nice? I'm like, no, no, we gotta do better. Uh, anybody here been to DOD on the Hill? We do, we do, student wise. Uh, we have a meeting every year in usually around April. This year, it's April 17th, 18th. We go down to Washington. As you see here, we have a group of people, um, students, young physicians, members on the board and other affiliates with us together. And that was a great shot with the Capitol behind us. A uh, beautiful day, it was a little cold, but a beautiful day. So we go to our local state representative's office, senator's office, and we usually have an ask for three areas. The three areas we asked for last year was to fund the TH programs, the, the, and we got that passed. Number two we asked was the Ready Act for debt relief for our students in residency. And the third ask was to stop these Medicare cuts. So we're working on that and we're continuing to work on that. And if you have an opportunity this year to go to DOD, it's a great experience. And you'll meet some very, very interesting people walking around all the Senate and House buildings and even the Capitol building. Now, this past year was a very rewarding year. Uh, my wife and I went to the International Association of Med Medical Regulatory Authorities called IAMRA, where there was a bill passed, DO equals MD throughout the world. So that has come up. We are looking to expand on that, and it's a very positive thing for our profession. 
One of our past presidents from the AOA from Maine, Dr. Boyd Boozer, if you ever meet him, he was also put on as a board member to IAMRA. So we're, we're doing good with IAMRA, we're doing good with the world. They understand our skills and training, and we're gonna see hopefully growth within the international uh, medical arena with our, with our philosophy and practice of osteopathic medicine. There's also the Osteopathic International Alliance. Let's remember, osteopaths outside of America are the equivalent to chiropractors. They're not osteopathic physicians as we train. So when you hear the word osteopath, remember that. That's what this Osteopathic International Alliance is. We're part of it just to make sure we understand what's going on there. Canada has opened up some more doors recently, mainly for pri primary care, but we're looking to, we're having continued meetings with the uh, Congressional leaders in Canada to open up Canada. Canada allows all allopathic physicians equal access to Canada. We want to see the same thing happen for osteopathic physicians. And this past year, we had the first granted license in the country of India. Uh, went to a physician, uh, board certified osteopathic OBGYN physician from California, and she got her license back in September. And we're hoping to expand on that and open up doors throughout many countries in the world. We have what's known as the Osteopathic Advocacy Network. It's a builds relationships with our policymakers. It engages in federal and state advocacy. It's built. We want to build influence in DC. Is where you where you get your policies written. Uh, we want to support our strategies from the AOA. It meets the first Wednesday every month. And if you're interested in going on, go to osteopathic.org slash grassroots. You could sign on. It's a one hour um, talk on Wednesday, first Wednesday of every month. It's run by our Washington office, Sean Neal and John Michael Villarama, and they've been with us for a long time and they, they know Washington as well as anybody. We have our Flu prevention toolkits, our social determinants of health toolkits, many different public health initiatives that the AOA sponsors and helps. Again, you can go to the osteopathic.org slash flu prevention, SDOH, and others to learn about what we offer these toolkits for our profession. We also partner, as I mentioned earlier, with lots of rural health stakeholders because this is a key area of growth of our profession and a big need of our country. Again, telehealth is important in our rural areas, the social determinant of health. Patients have trouble with food, with housing, with transportation, with medicines. Um, we wanna make sure that we're there for them. Behavioral health, opioid crisis is facing all of us. OMT will help prevent the usage of opioids if you use OMT properly and you do not need to use opioids at the rate that people are using opioids today. So it's something that we wanna work on together. Uh, we wanna to talk about vaccine hesitancy, COVID, RSV, and other treatments in rural America. We have the Osteopathic Pride campaign. Um, go to osteopathic.org slash DO proud, and you could celebrate our uniqueness in healthcare, our, our approach and perspective to DO care. And we're proud of our profession. We're proud of our students. And we wanna make sure that our profession knows, we know who we are and let all our students and everyone else know who we are. DEI is part of our profession. We're very receptive to making sure our workforce in Chicago, Washington is inclusive of equal opportunity for all. We have OMED programming in DEI and our COCA standards and state legislators make sure that we follow these guidelines. Burnout is a big problem for students, for physicians in healthcare. I saw a statistic recently that the uh, increased rate of suicide among physicians, nurses, allied healthcare professions are double that of the average in our society today. So there is some on-demand wellness webinars, again, as a member, which you all are members of the AOA and to our uh, members of our state association. Take advantage of this if you need it. And there's a simple way to, I feel that this is what helps me with burnout. And I could do 14 hour days, many days a week. I work hard, but think of three areas, how you can improve yourself and, and take care of burnout. Take care of yourself physically, work out, try to keep your, get your BMIs, 
as close to 25 or between 20 and 25 through proper diet, exercise, and nutrition. Emotional support you get from your friends, colleagues, family, friends. Keep that in mind and keep your spirituality in mind too and practice it in the way you feel best. Next OMED meeting coming up in San Antonio, Texas. It's, it's going to be September 19th to the 22nd. Last year, and this is our ribbon cutting ceremony for the uh, booths, uh, took place in Orlando, Florida. We had over 5,700 participants. And it was one of the, it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting. And we had some great responses back to us from everyone who attended. So if you have a chance to go to San Antonio, uh, I think the Dean wants to send all you them, all of you guys there, right? A couple buses, send them down. It'd be great. Um, you can download to your app, my, my AOA mobile app. You can stay in touch, get some news feeds, you get some discussions, community, the uh, CME tracker you'll get involved with later on because you're gonna need your CME to get your licensure and continue your certification process. And I just wanna conclude with a couple slides just to show you who's in our profession and how well people have advanced within our profession. Right now, J.D. Polk D.O. is the NASA Chief Health Medical Officer for this country. Uh, Dr. Dr. Hank Chaudhry D.O. is President and CEO of the U.S. Federation of State Medical Boards, so he runs all the medical boards throughout this, uh, our country. He's also the Secretary of IAMRA internationally. Sister Ann Brooks D.O. was the CEO of the Tutwiler Clinic in Mississippi. We have Ronald Blank Dio, 39th U.S. Army Surgeon General, and he's retired now, but he did a great job for our country. Omar Latif was one of our uh, keynote speakers at OMED this past year, and he's President and CEO of the Rush University System for Health and Rush University Medical Center. And Dr. Barbara Ross Lee Dio is the first female black dean of all U.S. medical schools in this country. So we have some great leaders. Um, our, the president, last two presidents actually had DO physicians in the White House. We have Dr. O'Connor right now, who is the president, uh, the president's physician doc, for Dr. Bi for, uh, Mr. Biden, and Mr. Dr. O'Connor is doing a great job as an osteopathic physician. And um, the past uh, president, Donald Trump, his personal physician is a DO, and he had made some. He he put a letter out, I think, about a month ago talking about the president's health, which the view did not like too well, but, and it kind of chopped our profession down a little bit, but I know Dr. Aaron Walt, he's a graduate also of, of uh, well, UMD now, Rowan Virtua, but so Dr. Aaron Walt's a great family physician, good friend of mine. So our physicians are in key places, key places throughout our country, and we're doing a great job. So just remember, you're in a great profession, use your skills, use your OMT, practice, and you're gonna have great futures here. Whatever the AOA could do to help you, please let me know. Um, everyone have, you have my contact. I, we sent in the back, you got your little card there about AOA and our state association. I wanna just bring up our president of the state association and our CEO also to say a few words for you. I think you have to turn it on. Again, thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Malika for coming here today. When we were in Atlantic City last year for AROC, it was one of our major, we knew it was gonna be a major lift to make sure this man, an alumnus of Rowan Virtual SOM, past president of NJOPS, ascended to become president of the AOA. It is monumental. And uh, we wanted to make sure that inauguration went off without a hitch, and it was one of the best I've ever been to. Um, but from a state level, one of the biggest things that our organization does is advocacy. And our executive director, and our Director of Legislative Affairs um, provides that, and they serve as your voice as osteopathic physicians. They serve as your voice to the AOA, to the state legislator, to the public. 
and it's very important that you become members because if you don't, you won't have anyone to support or speak on your behalf. Now, one of the things that I wanted to accomplish was to try to expand membership, uh, try to expand advocacy, and working with TIMA, we have done so. Another area that I thought was important was to work on the prior health, uh, prior authorization uh, laws in New Jersey, and our voices were met on a law that was recently passed through um, Senator Vin Gopal, and uh, he did take our uh, information. I would now like to have asked Ty Makovich, our executive director, to speak. Well, thank you so much, and uh, just like Dr. Scott has voice, we're so proud of you, Dr. Monk, and we were so happy to have been part of your inauguration and this year as a president. And just like the close relationship we have with Rowan Virtual School of Osteopathic Medicine, we have a very close working relationship with the American Osteopathic Association as well. And just to give you a little example and to piggyback of what Dr. Scott said, back in 2020, when the world shut down and doctors still needed to see their patients, there was tremendous amounts of confusion with who's the doctor and who isn't. And we actually worked very closely with the American Osteopathic Association to pass the Truth and Transparency Act here in the state of New Jersey. So essentially, when you're doing your rotations, when you go to a hospital, when you go to your family medicine physician, you see everyone has that little badge and indicates if you are a DO, an MD, an APN, an NP. That was the work of us with the American Osteopathic Association. I'm very proud to say that 22 other states have now adopted the Truth and Transparency Act. So, but that's a collaboration between our national organization and your state organization. And that's what happens when you have really strong members who are part, who want to take part and want to make the changes necessary. And actually, going back to one of the slides that Dr. Monka had, it had to do with that first Wednesday meeting of each month with the advocacy, um, I forget what it's called, the network, Boy. right? We work very close with what their Washington, D.C. office and Sean and Rain um, and Michael down there. And um, recently, as you have probably seen with the 5 million emails that we have sent out regarding the scope of practice rights here in the state of New Jersey, going back to the Truth and Transparency Act, the AOA and Sean down in Washington, D.C. were very kind enough to let us use their system so that we can utilize you to advocate to our legislators to encourage them not to pass the scope of practice rights here in New Jersey. And you probably saw in our January, I think, 8th announcement that we were very successful in stopping that advocacy as well. So you retain your full scope of practice rights as the nurses, APNs do theirs so that there's now no confusion with the patient. And again, you get to practice medicine as you have seen to be fit with the uh, hierarchy of medicine that was created in 1800. So um, I look forward to seeing everyone at AROC. We're going to have residency directors as initiated by Dr. Scott on our exhibit floor again. We'll also do residency and student poster presentations, which is going to be very new. I know um, your student council will be sending something out soon, but that's going to be Wednesday and Thursday. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and we look forward to seeing you at AROC. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Bomek, SGA President. We have Naomi Watkins Granville, SGA Vice President, and Dr. Monka, just behalf of the entire student administration, our student body, we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for one, being such an inspiration and taking on this uh, role 
and advocating for us, right? Your fruits of your labor are gonna pay so much dividends for it, not just for us now, for generations to come. So we just wanna thank you from the bottom of our hearts to take your time to come speak with us, give us updates, and um, it really means a lot to us. You're, you're a true inspiration for both of us, and we, we look forward to all the great work uh, we share to do with you. And uh, thank you so much, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you.